This is our final PowerPoint for the semester, um, and it's about stage spaces. Stage spaces is where plays are performed. We often just call it the stage or the theater. Uh, there's only two things required for performance spaces, places for the audience and places for the artist. Historically, there has been a lot of architectural design uh, geared toward maximizing the audience uh, performer relationship while at the same time allowing theater artists um, enough spa space and stage technology uh, to create the art that they would like to create. Therefore, we have a lot of different kinds of stage um, area spaces to audience seating uh, and designs for that. I'm going to go over the three most prominent, the three that are that we see the most often. Um, you will often see variations with the audience seating to the stage space within the three that I'm going to talk about. And the best way of determining the label for this stage space is to look at the seating. Um, see how the audience is seated in relation to the stage. What does the stage look like? Okay, it's also at this point that I want you to get the stage spaces class assignment worksheet that I put in Blackboard because we're going to do that worksheet together. So look at it, be prepared to take notes as I go further in this PowerPoint so that you can fill that out with this uh, PowerPoint and my lecture information to send it to me. So I would pause after this uh, slide so that you can prepare yourself to complete that worksheet. We're going to start with the proscenium stage. Uh, you have seen a proscenium stage because the play Sylvia was performed in Temple Theater, which is a pretty classic proscenium stage. Uh, sometimes it's also known as the picture frame stage because the audience looks through the proscenium arch. The proscenium arch is the opening um, that is on a, in the wall that would be the fourth wall of the theater itself. Um, you will see in the diagram below that it says stage and on either side before the apron, between the apron and the stage, there are little partial walls. If you were looking at that stage, you would see those go up and around the viewing area and that's called the proscenium arch. Um, when you're looking at the proscenium stage, everyone is facing the same direction. Uh, there is an apron and sometimes that apron can be, um, the floor can be removed or lowered and you have an orchestra pit, which is an area between the audience and the stage, between uh, uh, the audience and the performers where musicians can sit and they do not obstruct the view of the audience. Um, and it's great for musicals, etc. Uh, there's a couple of terms here in parentheses, um, actually three terms besides orchestra pit. The wings are either side backstage behind those little juts that come out to form the proscenium arch. By the way, the curtain, the main drape that closes, is behind that proscenium arch. Everything from the proscenium arch to the absolute end of the stage, whether the orchestra pit is being utilized or not, is called the apron. And of course, behind that proscenium on either, sta either side backstage, it's called the wings. The curtains that go up and down are legs. Um, we're not talking main drape now. We're talking about all the curtains that go 
from downstage to upstage. Those are called legs. They're to control the sight lines, what the audience can see. Um, you're hiding your backstage area where you might have actors waiting to come on stage, set pieces, etc. Borders are the small curtains that run across the top of the stage so that as the audience is seated, they cannot see up into the fly rail system. The fly rail system is a system of pulleys and poles, we call them battens, on which you attach lighting, uh, drops, painted pieces of scenery, and you can raise and lower uh, this um, using the fly rail system. Now, if you look at your class assignment worksheet, you will notice that I have a list of comparative elements. Those comparative elements are the are they're the things that for each of these theater spaces we're going to compare and decide is it advantage or is it a disadvantage. You'll notice I have given you numbers that allow you, give you a place to write down um, whether it is an advantage or a disadvantage. So for example under proscenium theater the comparative element number one what we're talking about here is the audience actor relationship. Okay so most proscenium stages are on the larger side. They're designed to do large shows, musicals, etc. that will uh, attract a large audience um, you have a lot of seating. So usually we do not consider most proscenium stages to be a very intimate playing space, acting space. Um, so number one comparative element. Uh, you would write on your worksheet the audience actor relationship is not very intimate. Now, number two, what is the effect this space has on scenery? Well, most proscenium stages, because they have things like an orchestra pit, the legs and borders to control sight lines, a fly rail system above, you have lots of scenic potential. You can put big sets on this stage, uh, a lot of people, uh, you've got lots of scenic potential, and number three, uh, how does this stage space affect the scenery being changed? Well, you have lots of options. Because you have a larger stage space with proscenium stages, you usually have more backstage storage area. Again, you have the fly rail uh, system above where you can raise and lower scenic pieces. Um, you can even close that main drape so you can hide your scene changes. So number three, you can um, hide your scene changes. You can uh, use the element of surprise when you open the curtain. Uh, how Number four, how the audience focus is affected. It's great audience focus because every seat is facing the stage. So you don't have to worry about a lot of distraction. And as I already mentioned, because it's a large stage, the square footage, you can get a lot of people on stage. So it's really good, again, for large cast shows or musicals where you need space for actors to be able to dance and move around on stage. Okay, so on our class assignment worksheet, this is our first stage space. And again, I'm going to repeat. Number one, the audience-actor relationship is not very intimate. On number two, you want to have written down that it's um, lots of scenic potential is available. Number three, it's great for scene changes. You can hide your scene changes. Number four, the audience focus is very good because everyone is facing forward. And five, you can have a lot of people on stage. Now keep in mind, when we are choosing our plays, we know our performance space. So we are choosing a space that we think our particular play will do very well in. 
The next space I want to go over is called the arena stage space. Uh, this is often called theater in the round. Some um, arena stages are very large. Uh, certainly if you go to a rock concert or a music event or something like that, uh, those are in stadiums, arena stages there. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a smaller scale. Usually the largest are three to four hundred seats. Uh, you see an image here of what is typical for an arena stage. Uh, the idea behind the arena stage is that you take all of the seats that would be on one side of the acting playing space and you divide it by four and that surrounds the space. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to this. If we look at our comparative elements, number one, which is a great advantage, is this is a very intimate space. Because there are no walls, because most of the audience is sitting closer to the actors, it gives the audience a sense of being in the same space, room, area that the actors are in. You can see facial expressions uh, with greater ease and it is a much more intimate space. Number two comparative element, however, it can be a disadvantage for some plays. Obviously you cannot have anything on one side that will obstruct the view of the audience. So you really can't have walls, doors, anything that is a solid obstruction. So it limits stage scenery. Number three, um, how scenery is changed. Well, you don't have a main drape. You can't hide your scene changes the way you can in a proscenium stage. So if you have any specialized props or scenery that you want to hide from your audience or need to hide from your audience, you might consider doing your play in a different stage space because you cannot hide scene changes. Um, and they can be a little more difficult in a space like this. You, generally when I am using arena staging, theater in the round, I am trying to do plays which require a lot fewer pieces of furniture, etc. to keep scene changes and everything at a minimum. Uh, number four comparative element, how the audience is focused. You know, you can see audience members sit, sitting across from you to your side. Um, I will not do children's theater in arena staging because they will all just wave and be real excited that they can see one another as well as watch the play. So your audience focus is affected by this stage space. It can be subjected to distraction. Um, number five comparative element cast size. You want to keep this to a small, medium-sized cast. People become obstacles in an arena setting, so you have to be very careful about how you uh, use this stage space. So again, the comparative elements for arena staging. Number one, your actor-audience relationship is very intimate. Number two, limited stage scenery. You can't have anything that obstructs view. Number three, you cannot hide and scene changes can be difficult. Number four, your audience focus can be um, diverted. It does affect the audience's focus. And cast size, this is a stage space that is really much better for a small cast show. Thrust staging is probably my favorite kind of stage space. It can also be referred to as three-quarter staging. Really, it is a stage that thrusts out into the audience seating so that you have audience on three sides. Um, a lot of thrust stages are smaller. They will only be 300 to 500 seats, you can have thrust stages that see, you know, 900 like our temple theater. Um, most thrust stages have an upstage area where there is a main drape. Often there is a fly rail system. 
So really, you kind of have the best of both worlds. Um, if you look at the comparative elements, what I like, number one, the audience-actor relationship, is that you can bring actors down closer to the audience and audience seating to create very intimate moments. So that actor-audience relationship can still be very intimate or it can be distant if you want. Um, two, effect on scenery. Well, you can have scenery upstage, but you can't have a lot of scenery downstage. It's a middle ground between the two. The scenery that is closer to the audience, this is number three, you do have to be aware, you cannot hide that, but if it's upstage, you know, you can often have a main drape that you can close, that you can hide upstage, and like I mentioned, there's a lot of thrust stages that on that upstage area, further away from the audience, there is that fly rail system. You have a backstage area. So, you know, you can create um, some nice scene changes. Your audience focus is good. There's something, um, I'm on number four, there's something about just three sides and not directly all four sides that keeps the audience very focused on the stage. Now your cast size is dependent on the square footage of your thrust stage. Some are small, so you want a small cast. Some are large, so you want a large cast. Again, I think that thrust staging is the best of both worlds. If we look at our comparative elements, number one, your audience-actor relationship is still intimate. It's good. Number two, you can have lots of scenic potential. It is still a, a, a really nice um, stage space for a play that has walls, has uh, traditional needs on stage. You can hide your scene changes. Number four, your audience focus is really good and your cast size, it's right in the middle. It depends on the size, literally the square footage of your stage space. Another space I want to talk about is often called the black box stage or in uh, our case it's the lab theater. It is a flexible stage space. It's often the easiest, most economical. I think it is um, the most flexible artistically because the idea is you have a, a, a large room painted black with a metal grid at the top for you to hang lights. And you have portable risers where you can arrange the seating to the stage space however you want to. Um, when we're doing, when we were planning on doing Wait Until Dark this semester, I was going to do it uh, back in the corner of our building where we have our black box. Um, again, you can create uh, arena staging, thrust staging. We have built a stage, so we had an, a, a small proscenium stage. We can fit about 100 people, 80 to 100 people in that stage space. Most flexible stage spaces uh, will only accommodate around 200. The idea is to create an intimate space with lots of flexibility for lots of different kinds of theater. Today, most theaters, uh, theater complexes or centers for the art have multiple stage spaces. We have a proscenium stage and a black box stage. Um, you get different stage spaces because different plays do better uh, in a different stage space. Found in created spaces, um, when you were doing performance theater, and sometimes this is called performance art, it includes street theater, this is any time you're doing performances in a space that is not designed, not meant specifically or only for theater performing spaces. This is when you're doing theater, say in a park, an amphitheater, uh, maybe in um, a cafe where they have a little stage for mu uh, music performances and you're doing a sketch or some, something like that. 
Um, if you get the opportunity to see created found theater at its best, go to the website for Improv Everywhere. Uh, Google Improv Everywhere, especially Food Court Musical. That's a great example of how you can do theater in a space that's not originally designed for theater, and yet it's still fun and, and effective, and the audience seems to enjoy it, even though they weren't expecting it.